you. It's an honor to be with you. Let me just say, it's great to look at it. Oh, I see that sucker a long time. <laughs> yeah, you look well. I feel good. Do I you? Good. No pressure. Yeah. It's nice to lead a life of no pressure whatsoever. Yeah. Corruption surrounded by corrupt judges and corrupt politicians. Other than that, there's no pressure. Well, you know, you and I talked the other night, and I work in trial sciences uh, for mm -hmm. a lot of my career, and so I have a particular interest in the dynamics of the trial setting. You're fighting this fight and standing up for the rights of due process and fighting against prosecutorial misconduct and prosecutorial abuse. You know, it was interesting when you called the other day about doing an interview. A lot of people want to do interviews, and I don't just agree to them very easily. But I've always had great respect for you. I watch your show. Some of the, uh, the real good ones and some of the less intellectual ones, and that's okay, too. But it's always been, uh, you've always been very special. And I knew that you were in some form very much involved with trials. And I found it to be very interesting that you would uh, take this up. It's a very important thing. I'm well, I, I wanted to, and I know that there was some news coming out of Georgia today. There was some news coming out of Florida today that they're stepping back yeah. from this. And very good news. Uh, I called for the other day, and I don't know if you saw it, but on Merritt Street Media, where I, I now do my show, I called for President Biden to stop all of this now. And of course, a lot of people said, oh, he can't stop it. It's a state case. Well, okay, that's an explanation for stupid people. But for people that understand how this works behind the scenes and all, I say the same thing. They need to stop this. They need to stop pursuing you. Since you started your campaign in 2015 to run for office, there have been so many attempts to get you off the board even before you started your campaign. Then when you, once you were in office, two impeachment opportunities, they changed the rules to try to make it high crimes and misdemeanors, if there were business conflicts, and in this case, in this case. It never ends. It seems to be never ending. And that is a distraction to you. Um, and, I, you know, I, I really wonder how that affects you. Well, what do you say to yourself about that? Because it seems to never be ending. It's a never ending thing. Uh, there's a term that I know you've heard many times. It's called Trump derangement syndrome. Right. And nobody's ever seen anything like it. Um, in one way, we drive them totally crazy because we're doing the right thing. You wonder, why would somebody want to have open borders where people are coming in from jails, prisons, where they're coming in from mental institutions? And as you know better than anyone else, they're coming in, they're releasing the people all over the world, not just South America, from mental institutions and jails and prisons. And uh, they're terrorists coming in by the thousands. They're pouring into our country. And who would allow this? You know, it's common sense, not a conservative thing. If they would devote that same skill and talent to making America great again, it would really be a wonderful thing. But in the meantime, we're beating them. You know, you mentioned I got impeached twice and I won twice very easily, very quickly. We had great support from the Republican right. Party. Uh, I have all these cases all my life. I didn't have any problem. And all of a sudden, within a matter of months, I end up with four cases. Now, of course, it's from the White House and the Department of Justice. They totally control the state case. In fact, uh, I'm not allowed to even be talking about certain aspects of it because I have a gag order. Think of it. I'm the Republican nominee. I was the president and I'm leading <clears throat> the current Democrat by a lot. And I'm not, I have a gag order from a local judge who was appointed by the Democrat Party. Local, a local judge. He's a local person. And he is appointed, and he put a gag on her. Well, Nobody's ever seen anything like it. While you're campaigning. You while I'm campaigning. Like you just mentioned a question that I'm not allowed to talk about. Right. Can you imagine? I'm the Republican nominee, and I'm not allowed to talk because a local judge from New York, appointed by Democrats, said, I can't talk about it. It's so unfair. And yeah. then he gives a jury charge. Nobody's ever heard of a charge like this. He gave instructions to the jury. And by the way, the jury happened to be in a location that was almost no Republicans. You understand that? Yeah, it's 87-13 in the last two elections, uh, Republican. And I know you can't talk about it. I'm not under a gag order. I do know that the number three person in the Department of Justice took a pay cut and went down in stature to go to a state job and become one of the lead prosecutors in this case. Uh, but yet they say, hey, Dr. Phil, why are you saying that uh, that President Biden needs to stop all of this? 
It's the state case. That's exactly why I'm saying it. Don't be naive, people. Understand that there's a power play going on it's here. It's controlled by the White House and the DOJ, yeah, 100%. And, you know, Gerard Baker wrote in Wall Street Journal today, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said, um, what do we say to those people that are rejoicing over reducing law to the status of a weapon in the hands of the dominant political power? Mm. Because uh, that's what's happening right now. It's become a weapon. And that's not what it's intended for. That's not what we need to be doing. I mean, right. let's let the people decide these, right? That's right. Uh, that was a very good statement in the Wall Street Journal. I read that this morning. And uh, it's so true. I mean, it's so accurate. They've weaponized to a level. They are trying to affect the election by demeaning, hurting in any form. And by the way, I think after the election, uh, they'll still, the hatred's great enough that they'll go, but it, with much less enthusiasm. This is about November 5th, which I think is gonna be the most important day in the history of our country. If we don't turn this around, we're not gonna have a country left anymore. Well, you, you, we're a country of laws, right? I mean, and that's what's made us so orderly. That's what's allowed us to progress forward. And. There's something that are called hornbook laws or black letter law that is just, these things are just been around so long. And these were violated in your case, one right after the other. For example, you don't let someone that has been charged in the same case as someone else and they made a plea deal and said, okay, I'm guilty of doing this because they were intimidated into doing it. The lawyer in your case, we don't even need to speak his name, he bartered around out from under 65 years, looking at 65 years of imprisonment down to three years and two years on this case and a tax case. So it went from 65 years down to five years in exchange for giving them testimony against yeah. you. That's not supposed to come in, yeah. but it did. Pecker uh, making a deal, a non-prosecution agreement. That's not supposed to come in, but it did. That got into the jury box. They got to hear all of that. And so they say, well, you know, if we're not down here for the reasons they're saying, then we need an alternative explanation, which they're not allowed to get because your expert witness that was going to come in and say, as a former chairman of the election commission, was going to say, this was looked at, there's no issues here. They, they didn't allow that person to talk, uh, to testify. And I, I'm looking at this saying, how is the jury supposed to solve this problem if they don't have all the pieces to the puzzle? They wouldn't listen to him, they wouldn't talk to him, they didn't want to hear his testimony. They knew what he was gonna say. He was gonna say it was 100%. And very importantly, when they tell somebody you're going to jail for 15 years unless you say bad things about this guy named Trump, okay? Now, in all fairness, we know a lot of great people, but you don't know too many that would say, I'm not gonna do what they want. Yeah. He goes up to somebody and they say, Dr. Phil, you're going to jail for 15 years unless you say bad things about Trump. And if you say the bad things, you're not going to jail at all. In fact, we're gonna make you a hero or you're gonna go for three months or you're gonna go for a short period of time. How many people are there that say, you know, I'm not going to do that? Uh, there have been people. Yeah, that's right. And those are, in my opinion, these are great people. What they've done to people that work for me is incredible. Yeah. Incredible. The threats, the taking of a gentleman who's been with me for years and telling me he's going to jail for 15 years unless they say. And he went back to jail a second time. I guess they didn't want him to testify. I don't know what happened exactly, but the threats that they made to this man, they've destroyed his life. These are fascists. You know, these are really bad people, Phil. And how, but who's gonna do it? You're going to jail for 15 years, or you're gonna go for 30 days or 40 days, or you're gonna go for no time, but you have to say bad things about Trump. Yeah, and that's intimidation. And, and, you, and some of these people, you look at their age, you look at their health, and for some of it could be a death sentence. And so they make a deal and, and that's what I talk about, that's what I mean when I say prosecutorial abuse. Did anyone ever approach you and try to get you to make a deal, drop out of the race, make a deal here, we'll leave you alone? No, they didn't, but I believe they would. If, they, if, if I would have offered that up, I don't think, I think they know me well enough, I think I really do, but uh, oh, if I didn't, run as an example i would have never had any of these lawsuits how about 
I get prosecuted on a person that I have no idea who she is. I have no idea who she is. I have to pay $91 million. And that judge was just as bad, just as corrupt, a corrupt judge. I have to pay $91 million to a woman. I have no idea who she is. She wrote a book and she made a statement in the book. And you know that case. That case is a disaster. And then you, but I have no idea who she is. And they said I did things. These people are corrupt and in some cases incompetent. But it's such an honor to have somebody like you see it and see it so clearly. And I knew that, I mean, I remember that years ago you were helping Oprah out and she was sued right. and it was having a big impact on her. Bad character. And I thought it was great. And you know, Oprah used to really like me. She was here many times. Yeah. She loved my key lime pie. We have key lime yes. pie and she loved a lot of things about Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. And uh, Roger King, as you know. Yeah, we were here for the funeral for correct. Roger King. Correct. Long time ago. It's the only funeral we've ever had at mar lago I said, maybe we can do a new business here. Yeah. We'll do op operate as a funeral parlor. But it was one of the most beautiful funerals in the ballroom behind us. It was, and he was a great guy. But, and Oprah's terrific. But once I announced I was running and I said, we have to have strong borders. We have to have this. We have to have that. Uh, we've sort of lost contact, as the expression goes. But I remember when you were very much involved in helping Oprah. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's been time and time again. And you know, that was another black letter law that you just don't do. The judge tells you, okay, you can testify, but I'm going to allow them to ask you about this person that you now owe $91 million. I'm going to allow them to ask you about this other case. I'm going to allow them to ask you about 10 contempt citations that I've given you. I'm gonna allow them to ask about all that stuff. What does any of that have to do with the matters at hand? And the answer is zero. That gets into the jury box if you take the witness stand. Again, that that is black letter law. You can't let in unrelated things that have more prejudicial impact than probative nature. That, that just doesn't happen, but it happened. One, two, three things right in a row, right. and you, that gets into the jury If you box. testify, they'll be able to ask you about all these different things. And by the way, if you say one thing that's, if you say it was a beautiful day, as I remember it, and it was raining out, we're going to indict you for perjury. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I'll tell you what, I have a lot of lawyers that are friends and this and that. I had probably 25 guys over the course of a couple of months say, whatever you do, don't testify because you'll say something that's a little bit off and you will be indicted for lying, for perjury. These are evil people. These are sick, evil people. Oh, I and, would have you know, thrown just, myself in front of your car to keep you from testifying. No, I know. I, I wanted to so badly. And I by know. the way, I would have loved to have testified about those things because it was so corrupt and so horrible, but he wouldn't have allowed me to answer the questions properly. No. And so I would have loved to have testified. I wanted to, I'm telling you, they had to hold me back. But uh, every, every lawyer that came, to, they, they'd always start to say, by the way, I'm afraid of you, don't testify. And they saw what he was doing. You can all, they can ask you about like anything. They can do nothing to do with this case. All of these outside things. And it was really an unfair trial. There's a very brilliant judge in Florida that's holding the government, it looks like, I mean, they're, she's looking into what happened. Because you know, they raided Mar-a-Lago. Right. And they took stuff out by the satchel. I mean, they took bags and bags of stuff. And I said, what are they taking? Are they saying what they're taking? Because they can add things. They can add the nuclear codes in there. They say, hey, he had the nuclear codes. And this was all stuff that under the Presidential Records Act, I'm allowed to do. By the way, Biden was totally exonerated. Now, I'm not sure I want that kind of an exoneration. They basically said he's incompetent to stay in trial, but he could be president. Think of that. He's not, he's not sharp enough, got no memory, got no this, got no that. He's, he's incompetent. Basically, they're saying he can't stay in trial due to incompetence, but he can run for president. What's going on? Yeah. Where, it, what are we missing here? Yeah, it, it makes everybody uncomfortable about that state of affairs. And what I was concerned about with everything that happened in this New York trial is there, one of the big myths is that the burden of proof lies with the prosecution. Mm -hmm. That is the law. But I can tell you after years and years and years of trial, the truth is that the jury sits there and says, hmm, I'm looking at all this, and if we're not down here for the reason they say we're down here, 
Somebody needs to give me an alternative explanation of why we are down here. So if we're not down here because of what the prosecutors are telling us, then what's the alternative story? What's the alternative explanation? And when you get muzzled in the way that this judge muzzled this case, they're sitting there saying, what's the rest of the story? You're not allowed to testify because you're in jeopardy if you do. They let all of this other stuff in that should never get into the jury box. And so, you know, the scales get tipped and it, it gets very, very difficult to get even one juror because there's not an alternative story that if you could tell without being in peril, if you can tell without being intimidated, it would be a very different situation. The burden legally is on the prosecution, but logically You're with the jury- You're guilty until proven innocent. Uh, that's that's, that's exactly the truth. That's, I can tell you, that's the truth with me. That's how that's it plays happened. out. And, I, and I, I, I did a focus group about this when I did a, a, sto a show on this on, on Merritt Street. And I did a, I had 250 people in, did a focus group, and I said, and overwhelmingly, the people were in your favor. But I found those that had questions, and I said, what is your question? They said, where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah. I didn't hear the other part of it. I'm more. sitting here, and you've asked me indirectly a couple of questions. They're so simple to answer, I'd love to yeah. And yet if I do, this guy's gonna, he's willing to throw you in jail, okay? This yeah. is an appointed judge, acting. He's an acting judge, appointed. And he's willing to throw you, and he's so conflicted. It's so sad. But you know, um, you do things for your country. And I view it, I think if my country weren't involved, because people say, the two questions, I, I, I get these questions from very tough guys like you. The biggest guys on Wall Street, the, you know, people that you read about, you know, but the tough, they're tough men and women. But I have the question asked often is number one, number one question I get, how do you stand it? How do you do it? How do you get up in the morning and put your clothing on and go to work? I do get that because people don't envy it. And the other one I get is, will they do it again? Meaning, will they cheat? Will they do it again? Will it happen again? Well, I have a different question than that how question. My question is why? I understand how. I know you got a thick skin. You're not one of those people that's afflicted with the need to be loved by strangers. I get that. I think that's true. My question is not how do you do it. My question is why do you do it? Why do you, let's face it. I mean, you're a billionaire. You got a great family. You're, you're a very dedicated father. People may not see this in you a lot because you keep that kind of private. But my question to you is why do you subject yourself to this? So there's a movement in this country. It's called MAGA. And Biden's always fighting it. We will stop MAGA. MAGA is make America great again. And we were doing, you know, I had an administration that was a tremendous success, even enemies. I mean, we had the greatest economy in history. We had the best job numbers in history. That's why I'm doing so well with the black and Hispanic vote. They had the best job numbers they've ever had. We were doing things that were incredible. And I was going through Russia, Russia, Russia hoax. I was going through the impeachment stuff, you know, all of that. And, you know, in one way, I, I jokingly said, somebody said, can you imagine what he could have done? Because I had one of the most successful presidencies, and yet I was constantly fighting off the radical left lunatics. They are deranged. They're, they are. It's like a derangement syndrome. But I actually said, you know, maybe in some ways I did better because I showed something. But maybe if I had too much time on my hands, it would have gone too far, and the administration wouldn't have been as successful as it was. When you look at our job numbers, I rebuilt the military, largest tax cuts ever. Largest tax cuts, bigger than the Reagan tax cuts. But higher Largest revenue. regulation cuts ever. I'm staying with my why question, because look at this. Everybody calls it inflation, but affordability. When we talk about gasoline under your administration, average 257 a gallon, under Biden, 361, 40 percent more. Un under your administration, homes, average uh, $320,000, under the Biden administration, 31% more, $420,000. Under your administration, interest rates, 3.8 average. Under the Biden administration, 39% more at 5.3%. Okay, now let's look at the border. Uh, under you, average 1.7 million border crossings. Their official number is 6.4. Oh, That's from Homeland so Security. Sure. It's actually about 13 million yeah. because I know I've been to the border. I've talked to the border guards down there, Brandon Judd. I've talked to 
uh, Jason Jones. I've talked to the people that actually know the numbers. They say it's between 10 and 13 million. So my point is, when you look at the actual numbers, plus the things you just talked about, lower taxes, higher tax revenue, you look at that and you would say, my God, he should be running unopposed. I mean, why? why? And these numbers, I just, I appreciate it, but, and these numbers are, are really, I don't know who made them. Very conservative. As, as an example, I had gasoline down to $1.87, not $2.57. Right. It's now almost at $4. It's going to be at $5 very shortly. Right. It's going way up. I took very conservative yeah. numbers so people couldn't well, argue Well, interest with them. rates, I was at 2.6%. They have 38 And now they're at 9%, 10%, you can't get money. So, you know, we did a great job. We did a great okay, job. Okay, so here's the question. Most people look at this from the standpoint of, they ask themselves the question, is my life better under this administration, or is it better under this administration? My quality of life, my ability to pay for my children's lunches, tennis shoes, getting them to the dentist, getting all of the different things that go to quality of life. And when we look at that, it's not even a close call. That's right. So why are people so energized against President Donald J. Trump? 